for people coming in now. We are now live on Facebook. And our attendees are coming in. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Fashion Network webinar. Uh, this one's titled Returns Are a Pain in the Pop a Pocket. Um, I was going to say something else then, but it's a good job I read the slides then. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this is going to be uh, an hour long uh, webinar. Um, it's going to be a panel discussion. We would welcome uh, any of your input during the talk as well. So, if you've got any comments, or any questions, you can use the chat facility uh, at the bottom of, uh, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat facility there. Uh, you can use, also use the Q&A one, but that doesn't get checked as much. Um, but we, so use the chat facility would probably be the best option. Uh, you can also, if you're brave enough, you can raise your hand. There's a little raise your hand feature as well, and we can actually turn your audio on so you can actually speak to any of our speakers uh, directly. So. Um, yeah, so just to give you a, a brief idea of how it's going to run. So um, we're going to have a little bit of a chat between ourselves for 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then as uh, the talk goes on, we'll start bringing in questions and comments from the floor. Um, the, I'll just show you what we're going to cover today. So this is going to be the discussion points. Um, so we're just going to look at sort of some of the main reasons why uh, brands and suppliers get returns. We're going to talk about various different practices to try and minimize these uh, and various other bits and bobs. So uh, if you have any other questions that don't appear on this list, I would suggest maybe make a note of it now, um, formulate your questions and, and send them through. It'd be great if you do send us questions uh, as text, if you don't make it too long, because obviously it's quite difficult to read uh, during the talk. Well, sorry, it's difficult for me to read, should we say, because um, uh, if it's that more than a paragraph long. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, and these are our very esteemed expertise here today. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves a little bit. So if I could start with you, Helen, just tell us a little bit about um, yourself, your background, how you come to do what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Helen Riley, Fashion Acquisition Manager at eBay. I've been working in uh, retail, fashion and online for uh, pretty much all of my career. Um, come from the south of England, went through your standard school and then uh, university um, road, did business studies and started off with a placement year at um, a small swimwear brand called Heidi Klein. At the time they just had one store in London, they've now expanded and wholesale I think to around 150 different places. Um, but that really uh, got me excited about buying merchandising and retail. So came out of university onto the Arcadia graduate course was there for three years, uh, call it retail boot camp, learnt everything you need to know about how to run a, a shop, I would say, uh, and then off to ASOS. So really exciting time to be at ASOS. Um, I think, I can't remember now, was it 2008, 2007, something like that, that I started there and I was there for almost eight years. So really saw from the inside um, online fashion growing and globalising and social media coming in and all that kind of stuff, which was really exciting. Um, I was a women's wear buyer there, um, working mostly with um, some of the big brands and then moved my branded experience over to eBay. Been at eBay now, um, going on five years, so been looking after some of our big brands and retailers when I first started and now concentrate mostly on new business and then all of the other um, wonderful things that come at you at eBay being such a big and interesting, exciting um, business to work for. So, for example, returns is something I'm really interested to uh, discuss today, professionally and personally. I'm a, a retail geek, so I'd uh, love to learn more about this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Patsy, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Patsy Perry, reader in fashion marketing in Manchester Fashion Institute at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I've recently moved over there from seven years beforehand at the University of Manchester. So I teach subjects around fashion marketing, e-commerce, supply chain and logistics. And I've been interested in the area of e-commerce distribution and logistics for fashion for a number of years. And I also have expertise around social and environmental impacts of the fashion industry 
and obviously um, the, the volume and complexity and increasing number of returns is, is part of that in environmental um, challenge now for retailers to address. Thank you and Steph over to you just tell us a little bit about um, your career history. No worries. Hi everyone, uh, Steph Tite from XPO Logistics. Um, so currently um, returns manager for XPO for UK and Ireland. So look after um, any of our customers, existing customers, where we have a returns operation and we want to um, maximise on efficiency and benefit for that customer and make sure that we are um, processing and delivering um, a great returns um, solution to them and also working on any new business opportunities um, whereby we need to design solutions to um, respond to our customers requirement. Thank you and your background is predominantly being in logistics isn't it if I remember rightly? Yeah it's all returned so I think I'm stuck here now for the long haul. <laughs> it's fair to say you might know a bit about the topic today. I hope <laughs> Um, we've got one Q&A already in, so I'll come to that in a bit. But before we've heard from the panellists. I just want to hear from the audience, actually. So we should, if this thing works, have a poll that I'm just going to share with you. So if you don't mind, um, if you could just fill in this poll for us, just to give us an idea what uh, is the most common reason for your returns. And now if you are a brand or a supplier, if you could just answer it as a brand or supplier, if you are a if you're not brand or supplier and you're just a customer, just answer it as a customer if that's okay. So we'll give it a few minutes and then I'll publish the poll. Uh, can the panelists see the poll at the moment or not? Yeah, we can see it, but we can't vote. Okay. I'd say doesn't suit me is my biggest reason. <laughs> doesn't look the same as it does on the size six model. It's my big reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go. Let's, let's, let's share the results. So it's sizing which is the yeah. most common uh, reason for that. You, you guys are all nodding. Do you concur with that then uh, from, from, from your point of view? Steph, you're just nodding. You know, is, that, is, that, is that what you experienced from? Yeah, because I think um, you know, we work with a multitude of, of different brands and um, it, different brands and different labels have different sizing and um, there's, there's not many... Um, that are, that there's no uniform so although yes we have uniform sizing but actually when it comes to different materials and the way it fits or the way you want it to hang um, or even how it looks on you compared to the image um, that can be quite a challenge so I think sizing and through from that unwanted um, category is where we see the most of our returns. Okay and you would imagine that would be the same across all logistics businesses and retailers is that would yeah. it be a fair assumption then and that's the same with you at ebay then would you say helen as well do you yes. that sort of yeah. so i think from my experience that both ebay and asos i've always been working with on a multi-brand brand basis so um what steph's saying is absolutely right all different brands and retailers even though it's standardized sizing it isn't actually the same we've all got our favorite shops that we go to because we know that we can buy something that fits us and then buy something online from somewhere else and you're having to go through the returns process and you're disappointed I think that is one of the big challenges there's lots of ways that brands and retailers are, are trying to get around that for sure but it's it's certainly something that's difficult I obviously have um, a good experience of I would hope how to buy things online because um, because of the work that I do but actually thinking about my sort of uh, the way that I personally shop I do stick to a couple of same yeah. websites that I know my way around and I can sort of have a very good guess of at what might be right for me. And sometimes if I go outside of that, it can, can go pretty wrong. Okay, cool. Um, we've already got a question already in, uh, actually from Charlotte, um, asking what ways can retailers make returns more sustainable? Um, Patsy, can I throw that one to you? That's okay. Really good question. So I think sizing is one issue where it's even more important when you're shopping online to have consistency in sizing. And we've seen reports of even within the same retailer that sizing can be very different across different styles of jeans, for example. I think H&M been one that's been featured um, in the press recently around that. So I think more information, um, more product, better product presentation, giving the, the measurements um, and a much greater description of things gives people a better idea of what they're actually buying um, and that can prevent um, returns. Um, and, and also thinking about packaging as well. Um, 
can we use something else apart from plastic? Um, is it possible to use cardboard or paper? Um, can the customer send it back in the same packaging? Um, and then what happens to that packaging when it gets back? Is it then recycled or, or is it binned? Um, and also how much packaging is needed to actually send the item out in the first place. So if you're buying something, you know, it, it is really important to get that presented correctly and not um, arriving in a, in a scrumpled old heap. But again, that can come into, you know, it's a balance between sustainability, isn't it, and customer service. And you mm -hmm. don't want the customer to be disappointed or for the item to be damaged in transit, either going out to the customer or coming back as a return. So I think balancing that those things is, um, is, is really important. And then the other thing is, does free returns actually encourage people to overorder or where there's a minimum spend to qualify for free returns? Are people actually using that to their advantage and ordering things that they have no intention of keeping? So I think, you know, customers are being trained to, you know, make, make the most of what retailers are offering them. Um, Steph, what's your thoughts on that whole free returns thing? Um, from a sustainability point of view, do you, know, do you know? From a sustainability point of view, free returns will um, inevitably, we, we know from research we do that um, customers will, yeah, a high percentage of customers will look at the returns policy before they um, follow through with a purchase in their basket, um, just to understand what that looks like. Um, so the, the issue is um, where you've got a kind of mainline brand that's available from the brand directly and then also available from um, a retailer that stocks multiple brands like an ASOS um, or a Next, um, if you don't follow suit, you're kind of not hitting that market leading um, customer experience. Um, so that there's a challenge there and you also, there's a trade-off between, um, yes, the sustainability, but also, as we've said about customer experience. So one of our very high-end customers has fantastic, beautiful packaging and it takes us a long time to, to package our products to reach the customer in such a, a wonderful um, box opening experience. However, you can choose not to ha have that experience as part of your um, sale and have a fully recycled box with minimal packaging um, but specifically people maybe buy that brand for the whole box opening experience um, a lot of our retailers and, and as we rank retailers and we look at what all of our customers are doing free returns is considered to be um, almost using returns to a competitive advantage so if um, the customer is reviewing the policy and we've got free returns and it's very easy to either drop it with Royal Mail or have it collected or drop points. Um, we find then that the customer will, will then follow through with the purchase and repeat purchase if they're happy with that experience. So although it doesn't help sustainability, I think what we need to look at is, is the, the issues we've discussed. So a lot of our customers are now looking at paperless returns and, and paperless orders. So if you can imagine the scale of orders that go out through ASOS um, from our operation every day, it, it's, it, removing that paper actually mm. does have a significant impact. Um, and the same with packaging. So being able to just use the, the bag for that the product goes out, turn it inside out and have an address returns label already on the bag. And, um, and what we do with all of our packaging is recycle it once we've processed it. So although the carrier bags that go through a DPD or a Royal Mail can't be um, reprocessed into more carrier bags, what we use them for is within the warehouse, we use them for um, waste bags, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a closed loop recycling. So, so you're feeling it at the moment. You are, you know, obviously you're on the front line. So you are feeling the impact of this whole sustainability uh, move, if you like. Yeah, and there's also the question in terms of, um, in terms of our fast fashion customers as to whether the price point um, requires the product to actually physically be returned depending on the return mm -hmm. reason uh, and if it is below a certain price point by the time the free return has been it's not a free return to the retailer the retailer covers the cost of that carrier so if you're talking about a £10 t-shirt or a £20 dress 
what's the point where the customer actually just gets a refund and we don't bother pulling it back because uh, there's okay. no value in doing that. Okay, 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 that's interesting. Um, just to go back on that sizing thing of the games, uh, I might come to you on this, Patsy. I've just had a question in here, actually. What do the panel think of pattern management throughout the production process? Well, this is quite interesting because we're considering doing a webinar actually about the whole digitization of the fashion supply chain. Um, do you, are you, what's your thoughts on, on, on that, Patsy, in terms of what, you know, suppliers, brands, whatever it may be, it doesn't have to necessarily be in fashion either, uh, could be, should be, are doing to sort of try and, you know, minimise the reasons for these returns? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting concept, isn't it? But it would require kind of collaboration at the competitive front. And we don't normally see that. So, um, you know, competitors might collaborate um, behind the scenes in the supply chain or around sustainability, but they wouldn't tend to really compete and um, collaborate together on their competitive edges, which mm -hmm. are market facing or consumer facing. So, I don't know, I think it'd be a brave person who is going to then share their patterns with a competitor retailer. Um, but it would make sense, wouldn't it? Um, I think customers would tend to go to different retailers at different life stages because our body shape changes over life. So, you know, what you're going to fit into at the age of 20 at Topshop, you might be a bit different by the time you get to, you know, 50, 60 into um, Marks and Spencer's ranges and so on. So it doesn't make sense for everybody to, to pattern match. But I think for those that are kind of going at the same target market, it, it could be useful, couldn't it? But I think... First and foremost, they need to pattern match within their own business, especially some of the, mm. the larger retailers who have, um, you know, they don't have pattern matching even within styles aimed at the same target market. So that might be a place to start, wouldn't it? Because I think the huge amount of different suppliers they're using and, um, you know, if the suppliers have got their own pattern, a lot of the time these suppliers are doing some of the um, design suggestions. Um, if they've been working with a retailer for a long time so you know not everything is actually coming from that retailer's head office anyway so that would be a useful exercise to start with or even just providing more information on the website i think there are there is an app now isn't there where you can put in your measurements and then it will tell you what size you are yeah, for lots of a apps number of different <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm i don't know how sent. effective those are i know I, well we're getting <laughs> like sent Helen says, all the time sorry you you tend to stick with the ones that you know, don't you? As Helen said earlier, so you, you yeah. stick with your kind of um, favourite brands that you know are reliable, that suit your body shape and you like the fit of them. And everyone's yeah. different, aren't they? So I'm I don't think pattern matching is going to happen anytime soon across um, competing retailers, but I may remain to be disproven. Yeah, I think definitely what you're saying, it needs to happen within the same brand as well. Still, there's a lot of that, but it just shows how fast paced fashion can be that that kind of finesse isn't always um, achieved at the moment. Mm -hmm. Fine, there was a good one, uh, according to Ibrahim. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good, um, I, I've had about five or six size and fits businesses approach me about doing something, you know, can we do, 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 can we do some marketing through you, whatever. And um, one we've had recently, um, it's quite interesting because they're using gaming technology. Um, they're sort of using scanning technology and mm -hmm. into virtual avatars and stuff like that. So it's quite interesting. I think, I think, th and I think it is motivated by return, reducing the return rates, basically. Sure. You know, so yeah. it'd be interesting to see what happens. Sorry, and that's the, place, that's the place to do it. I think you want to stop or limit the returns rather than solving the returns problem. So as much information and guidance that you can give at the beginning so the customer is actually ending up with the product they want is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, another question here. Can you put return costs into your original price to increase profit margin? Would that be a advice? I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. I thought that was standard practice. Steph, um, what's your thoughts on that? Um, so in, in my experience, there's often, um, a disjoint between the trading teams and logistics and returns. So, um, a trading team will buy a box or a garment at X price and, um, not necessarily consider the logistics costs of returns in, in that, um, whole scenario. Right. So... Um, very often because they don't get charged the logistics cost because um, it's just part of what happens in the business but if you start to look at end-to-end -end, um, cost of cost to serve 
you should always factor in that returns. And we know for fashion, it's around 25%. So you need to factor that in. Not fast, so where, not fast fashion, no. <laughs> um, so you need to factor in that um, cost because although it's not a cost to you in terms of trading and, and hurting your margin because you're looking at what you've sold out, it's a cost to the business overall because we're still having to process that return back in and the business is paying for that logistics process to take place and you're still left with, with stock coming back in. Um, so you should factor in, um, firstly, the returns rate for sure and the cost of that. And secondly, how much of that is going to be unwanted and therefore is going to replace back into stock because we very often see retailers ordering prime, prime, prime from suppliers and not forgetting that we're adding back into that from returns. And at the end of season, you can be left with more stock than, than you forecast because you haven't factored that in. So you're sort of blaming the buying and the merch teams then really for not really... Well, I, just, I think some places have got it very well. Um, they, they talk to each other and it's an end-to-end -end view. There's still a lot of retailers that if you ask them, I don't think they could give you a definitive end-to-end -end cost for an item. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I was, at this stage, I was supposed to have another poll, actually, just about has the returns rate increased during lockdown, but I can't find the poll in the back end. So can any of you sort of give us any insights to whether the return rate has gone up? During, I'm assuming it must have done. Helen, have you noticed it at eBay? Or? Well, online sales have definitely gone up, and um, a lot of retailers to be competitive in the market have extended their returns period especially during the beginning of um, the pandemic because obviously people weren't able to move around so much so I would imagine that that has encouraged um, returns to go up. Mm -hmm. um, Steph you were nodding when I asked that. Yeah, I mean online, online sales have have increased um, however a lot of our operations when we were all in lockdown saw a massive decrease in returns so whether customers are more sure about what they're ordering. And we also think there's maybe a theory in that we're not ordering um, going out clothes, occasion mm. wear. What we're ordering is loungewear. So if it's a bit baggy or it's a bit short, it doesn't really matter because you're wearing it around the house. Yep. And therefore you're more confident about your purchase, which is, is maybe what's driving our, what we're seeing in a, in a kind of reduced returns rate. And also that it's locked down and people generally aren't, you know, they weren't returning an item to the post office wasn't top of their priority. Um, but I do think that what was in, in terms of sales categories is, is relevant because like I said, you, you're more concerned about a hundred pound dress for a wedding and how it looks as to a tracksuit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's definitely true. It definitely varies greatly across categories and also selling price as well. Uh, higher the selling price, the more likely you can return it, of course. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to, um, obviously we talked a little bit about size and fit apps, um, but I just want to talk a little bit about what other technologies are on the market at the moment to help minimise returns. Um, can anyone else, uh, Patsy, have you got any insights on that? Are there any other sort of like cool apps or, or maybe B2B based software platforms that's, that, that, that can help people? Um, technologies. Uh, I think we've seen, um, I mean, some people are using augmented reality, aren't they? Mm -hmm. to, to, so you can use it on your, your mobile phone in the house and see what it might look like on you. But I don't know how realistic that actually is. But I think some of the age old technologies in terms of um, catwalk view, so you can see how the product moves in real time is really useful, isn't it? And you can get an idea of Mm -hmm. the weight of the fabric that way so it doesn't turn up and then you're disappointed because it's dead flimsy or it's too thick or something so I just think um, you know more, more realistic images you, you can't really beat that some of the the AR stuff is maybe a little bit of a gimmick um, so it's not for, for all consumers um, but it could be a bit more engaging and fun for, for some people to work with yeah I definitely agree about B2B stuff mm. but catwalks definitely agree that they really help the way that you can see clothing move on them. The only other thing that I've um, found useful is uh, algorithms. So on websites that I might shop on regularly, they'll suggest what my size is from what I've bought and returned or not returned before. 
I find that quite helpful, you know, if you're buying extra small, medium rather than eight mm. and 12, etc. Does eBay have like a video type feature on it now to be able to do stuff like that? On uh, yes, so it's, it's up to the individual um, brands okay. and retailers how they want to do it. Because ASOS did, didn't they? ASOS had yeah, them. they've done it from the beginning. I think mm. they were the pioneers of that, yeah. Steph, from your perspective then, have you noticed any new technology apart from like your size and fix fit stuff that's, that's popped up over the last few years to help minimise? Not in terms of minimising um, returns, and I think we still go back to the argument as a retailer, do we want to make returns as simple as possible and therefore attract more customers, a bigger basket size and um, a great customer experience. Um, so it, I'm seeing a lot more around, um, around that element in terms of customer experience and um, best in class rather than trying to minimize. There's still an argument, but a lot of retailers are taking on board that um, having a seamless returns experience can be a competitive advantage and therefore that's what they're striving for. Um. Got a couple of other interesting questions just come in. Another one from Charlotte. How much salvage takes place within the fashion to maximise value of return stock and inc inc increase saleability? Who'd like to pick that up? Yeah, I can pick that up. Yep. So all of our um, all of our fashion ecom uh, operations have an element of salvage. Um, it depends very much on the price point of the product, seasonality how that product has previously sold through um, but in essence what we try and do is get as much stock as possible back into pick face and we'll pick from return stock first um, to make sure that goes back out to a customer um, so yeah we, we do an element and even on non-fashion product um, we have salvage operations refurb testing um, but there's obviously a limit cost limit isn't it because i mean i think hell yes. and i were talking about this where does it stop being viable to, to 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 do this yeah and it depends on the process that we're going to carry out on the garment and also um the the cost price and like i said seasonality there's no point in in you know rectifying a whole load of um summer stock now um and it's whether it, it, it all depends on individual retailers and what their rules are. And we know for you know, a customer like Ted Baker, who um, you'll notice that they will do the same kind of design coat every season, but it will have a different lining, and different buttons. So things like that um, are not, you know, we have to be careful what we put back into stock and it's whether it's going to sell through again. Um, but our WMS has been designed to um, cater for um, our clients' requirements. So we can put rules in the background in terms of um, how quickly that product sold through previously. So if it's, if it's essentially got back orders or it's out of stock on the web, then we need to prioritize reprocessing that item because mm -hmm. actually it's really popular. If it's over 50 pounds and it's a summer dress and um, it's popular, then yes, we'll rectify. If it's a 10 pound t-shirt and it's got a rip, um, across the middle, no, we won't rectify. If it's a seam rip, that's different. So there's all different rules that our mm. clients can set in terms of how we how we manage that salvage process according to their requirements. It's really interesting, actually, because from your perspective, Steph, it's like you, you, you. I'm surprised you're not even more closer to the production teams, because I mean you're providing this sort of feedback. You know, from my experience, you know, you see design teams produce stuff, and sometimes they don't realise that things haven't sold because the collars off or the fabric doesn't hang right. Yeah, and we, like you know, returns generates an awful, an awful lot of data. Mm -hmm. And what we strive to do from that data is, is then give our customers back meaningful information. Um, so, yes, we do feedback. We can see pandemic faults really quite early. Mm -hmm. And especially if we manage the whole of the process for the customer. So where we manage the inbound and the, um, the QC for Ted Baker, We'll see a fault even before it gets out onto pick, but you mm -hmm. know, but in, where we just manage returns or or we um, we don't do a, a detailed QC, then returns really does give you an insight into product quality and mm. and also using that converting that data into meaningful information can also enable you as a retailer to have some quite challenging conversations with your suppliers. So if quality hasn't been met. Um, 
you've kind of got the evidence and the backup to, to show what, what reasons there were behind the quality issues and, and yeah, financial conversations and commercial conversations can be aided by that kind of information. Yeah. Another question just come in, <coughs> excuse me. Do you see more retailers? <coughs> excuse me. No coughing in 2020, please, Dale. <laughs> <coughs> can you read that? <laughs> Which one is it? It's, do you see more retailers adopting B2B? Adopting B2B clearance channels okay. to support their secondary market inventories based on the increase of consumer returns. So, um, yes, we do. There's still um, brands where they are extremely protective about their brand label and where it goes, um, mainly high-end um fashion brands but not not just them in the electronics market um mobile phones etc cetera, etc cetera. They, they are quite passionate um there's a there's definitely a trade-off between b2b and b2c so i think with the likes of an ebay if a retailer sells through an ebay they're very close to that end consumer and um, so it almost minimizes the risk in terms of where that product might end up so you know for like a um an outlet on ebay for for a brand the the you know customers are buying one t-shirt and you know it's going to that customer and that's it if we're b2b selling then you're selling by pallet to traders who then sell to traders so depending but, but you can set rules on secondary market platforms to say i don't want my stock to go here or it needs to be delabeled or whatever it might be but it's a trade-off between timing and how quickly you need to, um, you, you almost need to return the revenue back to the bottom line. So B to C is a slower process via an eBay. It's, it's less risk, but it, it, your money's coming in, in in little chunks. If you're just clearing your returns in bulk via a B to B platform, then that's it. They've gone and, and you, your revenue's back in. So, yeah, I mean, that's something I've experienced at the Fashion Network. Funny enough, we do dip our toes in the water with this. There is a, quite a lot of it going on behind the scenes, people selling offshore. A lot of it's offshore to, to territories yeah. that they don't normally sell in. <clears throat> a lot of the time it's just clearing, because I think a lot of people understand the cost of having stuff in the warehouse. Sometimes a lot of delabeling, all that sort of stuff. That's something. And, and you know, I've had conversations with certain people, some, some in, this, in this webinar, about ways of actually offloading, you know, returns to traders there's plenty of them out there actually and we've got a few on our database if anyone's interested um next thing i wanted to ask about is this thing called wardroping so i i, I, I i'm not that familiar with this so i don't know um helen and patsy are both smiling uh at the same rate. <laughs> I don't know who wants to pick this up tell me what it is and and um how can we overcome it so wardrobing is um using the, the, the retailer's uh, free delivery and returns process as a way of hiring stuff without having to pay for it. So you may um, order something, wear it to a wedding, you think, I've only had it on for a couple of hours, I'm just going to send it back and get 200 quid back for that dress or whatever. Or you may just want to pose for a selfie in it because um, mm -hmm. you know that's another trend where you don't really need ownership of the product, you just need access to it for a very short period of time. Um, and then you may decide that you don't, you're not going to wear it again for whatever reason. So off it goes back and that's within the retailer's returns policy. So right. often the retailer may not notice, but, um, you know, sometimes I guess, you know, Steph, you'll get stuff back and it's got confetti on it and <laughs> wedding invitations in the pocket and so on and so <laughs> forth. And, you know, we, we've seen that in in-store retail as well for, for many years where people have, you know, been a bit cheeky and try to return things often <laughs> much, much later when they've, obviously been worn but you may, maybe it's easier to do on um, online because you're not having to go in and speak to a person face to face so you don't have that embarrassment shame factor you just pop it in the envelope off it goes and and then your refund comes through yeah I've so some retailers are doing a lot more data suits. analysis <laughs> around this uh, a lot of um, but, um, sorry Dan. a lot of retailers now are starting to segment customers so you can see um I'd probably say returning it to a store is a little bit more anonymous because you only have to fill in your name and whatever address you, you get to fill in on the receipt. Whereas the e-commerce is your, obviously it'll be fraudulent data, but generally it's your, your data. Um, so yeah, customers are starting to segment um, 
their consumer in terms of you've got someone who will spend a vast amount of money with you and, and sit on a normal returns rate or below normal. You've got people that will spend a, a vast amount of money and return 95% of it. And it's those guys that you want to try and eradicate. So I, I know of retailers that have actually stopped trading with certain consumers because of their cost to serve. Um, now, whether you want to take a move as bold as that it is, is to be questioned. Um, but I definitely think e-commerce allows you to start to perform some really good analysis on your consumer and how they behave. And also, if you've got a fantastic consumer and they are brand loyal and they return in a, in a great way, then why not give them first option on sales? Why not give them, you know, um, express delivery, et cetera, et cetera, to maintain it and to, to recognize that they are a great consumer. So there's a lot of that going on for sure. Um, but, sorry, go on. But in terms of actual physical, so a lot of our retailers now will put a wardrobe and tag on the garment. So it'll be on a key main seam. Um, so either on a front collar or on the seam down the side or here on this seam so that you can't wear it to a wedding because it's got a huge tag that says uh, wardrobe tag. Um, please do not try and return me if you move this tag. Um, and you, you know, you can't and Instagram it, you can't wear it to a wedding. So we are becoming a lot more um, privy to, to that behavior. And there's also a lot, you know, retailers are becoming a little bit more savvy and also understanding that trading with these type of customers isn't a benefit to the, to the retailer necessarily. There's also potentially an opportunity there as well. I mean, I've spoken another webinar about renting garments and stuff like that, because, you know, you're talking about getting stuff to Instagram. And I mean, I don't know if it, the guys that live in Manchester go down Deansgate on a Saturday night and see all those guys with Lamborghinis. You know, I'm pretty sure not many of them own those Lamborghinis. They just rent them for the weekend. So there's an opportunity here to offer, offer up a rental sort of site. It's been, it's been a massive, I, I don't know if you, if, you guys, Patsy and Helen, agree, but this year I've spoken to quite a few um, companies that are specialising now in um, rental of clothing, handbags, shoes. Um, it seems to be growing really quickly and rapidly because you do only want a garment for one occasion if you're going to the races or you're going mm. to a wedding. Um, so why not hire it for a week, send it back, they'll dry clean it, um, et cetera, et cetera, and it, it's a fraction of the price. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And we do that in so many different areas of our lives. Like I rent my music from Spotify, I rent my TV from Netflix. I don't do it on clothing yet. Perhaps that's because I'm stuck in my ways because of the way that I've you know, been behaving for years. But it's certainly the way that the younger generation are thinking about a lot of different areas of their life. Well, I mean, I've always, well, I just realised that perhaps maybe I might have been guilty of wardroping. But I remember years ago when you want to get a dinner suit or, you know, before... You know, you just, you just go to a certain high street retailer and get, get the suit and take it back. But obviously, nowadays you just hire hire the suit, and you know, you know, because you, know, you don't. Why well, I actually own a dinner suit now, but but you know that that's quite a standard practice. I mean, we probably do it more than we think in many respects. You know, but it's, I would imagine it favours higher priced garments rather than you know fast yeah. fashion, for example. I think with the rentals, it needs to meet the same experience criteria as um, e-commerce would. So I think if you can get next day de delivery, um, convenience, and also wide selection, sizing availability, and so on. Um, but again, you've got the issue of hygiene and people's perceptions around hygiene. Mm. And if you are ordering something brand new, I mean, somebody may have already ordered it before you and worn it, tried it on. You don't know that, but you think it's brand new. Whereas with the with the hiring, you don't know how many people have worn it before you. So some people might be a bit, you know, the icky factor around that. Um, so I think they've got a few barriers to overcome. And, and just to make sure that that service, it meets the same criteria as shopping online. But of course, wardrobing is still free, isn't it? until you get banned whereas hiring <laughs> there is a cost to that <laughs> we, we've seen jobs advertised through through us i think on people just to, to go out and i've heard that just literally go on instagram and just you know spot people and scan these images in and send them back to people and say yeah. look you know what you, you, you were turning this but we've seen you've been out with this and, you know, fantastic so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um anna set a question saying what are the panelists thoughts on renting so we've kind of touched on that i think now 
you think big retailers cash in on this? Uh, I've got a couple other questions that are on the discussion points. So um, I just want to go back to the whole reprocessing thing a little bit. Um, oh, no, actually, there's, there was another question here, actually, uh, from uh, Anonymous. In terms of placing the burden on the re returns cost, what practices would you recommend to smaller independent designer brands? Should they add the cost to the garment price, making it more expensive? and less competitive or keep the product cost lower but make the customer pay for turns. Helen, can I come to you on that? What's, what's your yeah, thoughts on that? It's, it's, a it's, all a, yeah, it's all a balancing act. So of course you've got to make it profitable for yourself, but then if you're adding too many other very visible costs into your retailing price, so you're not going to be converting into sales. So I think it's a case of just knowing what's going on in the market and making sure you're competitive to um, your adjacencies. Okay. Um, Another question, what's the best method to move product abroad and how do you deal with the return of product growing stroke coming from abroad? Who'd like that one? Um, I'll take that one. So it really depends on the volumes that you're talking about in terms of shipping abroad. So um, in light of um, the, the B word Brexit, um, there are retailers who are currently shipping over border but are now exploring the opportunities of returns in um, Europe. But again, you have to have the, the scalability to be able to um, almost make that work for you. So it, it's it's a, almost a trade-off in terms of how much you're shipping back and forth and whether you, you have the... Um, have the kind of um, cost price and, and the, the benefit, the return on investment in opening another warehouse on, on mainland Europe, does that pay or does it actually cause you a, a financial challenge? So it, it would depend on volume, but we, we're definitely seeing um, large retailers who either fulfil from Europe into the UK and don't have UK footprint, looking for footprint in the UK, or fulfill Europe from the UK and don't have footprint now wanting space in Europe. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely on people's agenda. Okay. Um, my next point of discussion then is I want to go back to this whole environmental thing. I'm going to come to you, Patsy, about this, but um, what, what are the sort of, what are the environmental, because obviously now, because particularly with the whole COVID lockdown, there's a lot of talk now about sustainability, certainly when we put posts out on our, uh, publish stuff on our LinkedIn page and stuff like that. The, the sustainability things just get fun, you know, and um, people just are on it. So can you talk us a little bit more about sort of the environmental impacts of returns? What are the main things that you, you're noticing that, 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 you know, returns, the a badly managed returns thing is affecting? So as well as all the, the waste of the whole production process before then, and we know all about the, the sweatshops in garment manufacturing, the pollution in textile manufacturing and so on. So all of that, and then it goes into a return and sometimes that can't be resold. So it just gets landfilled. So all of that process has been completely wasted. Plus you're adding to the landfill problem. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the, the whole um, carbon footprint of that last mile between the um, distribution warehouse and the consumer then coming back again and also the single-use plastics um, for the packaging. So I think that that's the issue, and people are super sensitive to these um, issues now. I think we had a Copenhagen Fashion Summit was on earlier this week, and there's a lot of criticism around that, um, a lot of greenwashing from the big brands. People were talking about that, and you know, lack of workers' voice and so on. So I think a lot of you know younger people, students in particular, they're very sensitive to what they perceive as brands and retailers greenwashing and you know talking about their sustainability credentials but it's actually sorry sorry can you just explain greenwashing what they should be what's greenwashing? So greenwashing would be talking about your sustainability credentials but actually you, you don't back that up right. so for example you might say about h&m comes across portrays themselves as doing this closed loop um recycling and so on but the actual volume of stuff that they're putting out onto the market is far beyond anything that they they take back um, so again, it's trying, it's pulling the wool over your consumer's eyes basically by saying one thing, but actually you're not as green as, as what you make out to be. So I think people are a lot more critical now and it's, um, you know, it's really about your reputation. So this, this does need to be managed and, and people are quite aware of, you know, how many people are shopping online now. Um, you know, all of the delivery trucks out there, 
and so on. So I think, um, you know, but, but as, as we've said, sometimes it's not worth reprocessing that item. And there are things that consumers can do as well. So we, we all have a responsibility to feed into this issue. And it's about not over ordering, not just um, shopping online just because you're bored and you don't really need that stuff. And also, if you are going to send something back, you know, send it back in the condition that, that it arrived in. And don't you know screw it up and throw it in a plastic bag and pull the button off and so on but even something such as putting the laces back into a pair of trainers you know that might not get reprocessed has it so i think as the poll said most reasons why people return something is sizing it's not about quality or you know there's a quality issue with it it would appear so we need to make sure that if it's just the sizing's off that we pack it up nicely send it back and then hopefully it's got more chance then of being sold on to another consumer in good time rather than kind of um, sending it back in a heap. And then, but I think this, this is only sorry, become God. more important as, as we go on. So yeah, it's that, that sort of balance between customer service, but also sustainability as well. And it's, and it's difficult this, to manage. This landfill thing. I mean, I mean, we've seen reports in the press uh, recently about brands just landfilling a lot of these returns. I mean, how big a problem is that? Well, nobody will admit to it, but there have been um, reports such as coming out of um, America in terms of some of these um, logistics companies that will say, you know, we, we have landfilled, you know, so many billions of dollars worth of goods in the last year, but we don't know about particular brands because, of course, you're not going to want to admit to that, are you? So, but if it's, if it's not worth your while, it makes no business sense to go through all of that pain of reprocessing things if um you know steph says you may as well just give the customer a refund generate some goodwill and let them keep hold of the item rather than asking for them to send it back mm -hmm. generating carbon footprint and then you know it's more cost to the retailer isn't it but everything has to make business sense first and foremost so ah. sometimes the best option may be to landfill hadn't it mm. um but I mean, if you obviously don't get them to return it, then technically you're going to have a lot of people then just basically getting free clothes, technically. Yeah, yeah. so it might end up getting hoarded in their wardrobe or getting mm. landfilled by the consumer. But <laughs> Yeah, it could just end up as fragmented landfill uh, all from the consumer's homes as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I've got a couple more questions um, before uh, we then um, look at slowly winding down the webinar so i just want to talk a bit about um the whole reprocessing thing again how what what to do with it i mean obviously head and i we've had informal conversations about you know returns as a business i mean what is the business opportunity to sell on returns um you know tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that from my point of view i definitely uh, have a consumer or can see consumers in the market that would be interested in buying returns you know a product that's at uh, an even better price than it was originally, perhaps slightly out of season, for example. But I think something that we've been talking about here, um, bringing well, fast, fast fashion, basically, I think it's kind of a perfect storm of a lot of the challenges when it comes to returns. So it's super competitive in the market. They're having to offer free delivery to get the conversion. The price point is lower. The nature of the product is going, like the trends are changing very quickly. So there's definitely a lot of returns of that ilk out there in the market, but then we've alluded to the fact that by the time you've returned it, possibly by overseas, then reprocessed it, and it's gone a weeks past its prime selling, actually, how profitable is it to go through all of those different processes to then get it back in front of the consumer? I think it's really, really difficult, and I'm not sure that I'm convinced that many people have managed to figure out how to make it more sustainable or um, more profitable in the market yeah i think it's a real challenge in the industry yeah it seems it um steph from your point of view what's what's you know what's the opportunity to to sell on these returns and make some sort of business opportunity out of it do you do you, do you notice it do you notice your clients doing stuff with it or yeah certain certain customers so um some customers are very um good and have a very strong uh, proposition so if it can't go back to a grade stock we, we know certain brands have got factory outlets um discount stores um or ebay outlets etc cetera, etc cetera. so um that's them still maintaining control of the brand um the last kind of port of call for them is is to use a secondary market like a, a jobber or or something of that ilk or b2b um to to clear the stock but um in terms of fast fashion, ultimately, if, if we can't get it back to stock, um, we're left with 
rag so there is the opportunity to to pull back to thread and and to recycle product um but rectification on those items is minimal due to their price point um so yeah it, it all depends on customer brand protection and and price point for us really those are the main points can you give us an idea like where it's worth reprocessing it and where it isn't is there a price point is there a kind of like right you know obviously like if you're dealing with high price products whether it's fashion or homeware or whatever is there kind of like well it's not worth this now where, where, where does that start you again say? it depends on the on the customer our customer and and how they want to position that and also the level of rectification we're doing so we can do um something as simple as um just um you know, just just brushing the garment and maybe using a baby wipe to remove any makeup or residual marks around the collar. Um, but then we can go in depth and, uh, you know, on certain sites, we've got dedicated clean rooms where we um, have tailors and seamstresses and we do a, a very detailed um, rectification of the product. It's generally driven by price point and also the price of it is the trade off of the cost of reprocessing versus the cost of restocking that item and, and the value to the customer. Okay. A couple more questions coming in. One from Joshua here. How do you make cus can, um, customer care about returning product well? Can you use campaign or other methods? Helen, you're nodding away up there. Yeah, I think Patsy was just saying about the so consumer responsibility as well. And I think that's so true. Like, you know, there's so many things in this world that you could do, but you don't because you're trying to be a good citizen or whatever. And I think there's definitely that culture of, oh, I'll just buy it because I can return it and it's free delivery. So the consumer as well as the retailer needs to be making, taking more responsibility for it and thinking actually what's happening to that product when it goes back and the time they're taking to look after it. I think so, you could put some nice messaging on the, um, on the packaging, couldn't you? Because you don't want to yeah. reach to consumer. So you've got to be careful how you say these things, mm -hmm. but you could say it in a cute way. So... You know, yeah. if you don't want me, somebody else might love me. Please send me back and fold me up nicely, you know, rather than saying you must do this or else. Yeah. So it's about balancing that customer service, isn't it? And not pissing off your consumers. Yeah, I think that's a really great idea. And it could be a lovely branding piece. You can have a picture of me going like that. Don't return. <laughs> I wouldn't think that would work. <laughs> we got another question here as well um, from John. Does the panel think that landfill could be the result of poor communication by the retailer to the supplier in the form of misleading thick comments, lack of understanding of pattern cutting mm. and construction? Yeah, I suppose that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, how yeah. we do in the UK and globally have standardised sizing. But of course, we all know that different shops aren't standardised sizing exactly. And, and within the brands, uh, they're not. So there's definitely improvements that can be made. And I think, again, it's a reflection of how fast and competitive uh, fashion is, especially in, in certain areas. So there definitely is some finessing and refining that can be made in a lot of ways, for sure. Did you want to add to that or...? Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's difficult to manage because of the volume of some businesses, but I think we can all think of examples of brands where we they're very, very consistent in terms of their sizing. So it, it goes to show it can be achieved and it's just about um, making sure, you know, all suppliers are on board and, and things are communicated well and there aren't mistakes going out in, in tech packs and, you know, changes to designs and so on. And, and what you're specifying is, is correct um, to encourage, you know, the, the right things to come in and then get um, sent out to consumers. So I think there is work that could be work done, as Helen said, in terms of finessing that consistency. Mm -hmm. consistency. And it is possible because some brands do get it right. Yeah. Yeah, in my experience, the own labels that I've worked for have taken it very seriously and, in my opinion, uh, have done a good job of it. Okay, guys, we're sort of coming to the sort of final leg of the webinar. So if any, you guys out there have got any other questions, then please send them through. Um, you're also more than welcome to use my favourite feature on Zoom, which is the live audio thing. So you just put your hand up for that. Um, so, yeah, any more questions, please let us know in the next five minutes. Um, I've got a couple of other questions here. So just going back onto that um, supply chain thing as well. Um, we are looking here at the Fashion Network to try and do a digitising the supply chain um, thing because there's lots of different businesses out there that are trying to, you know, minimise faults and make sure that the, the right tech packs are getting through. And, you know, when you update your pattern on this end, it, it updates in the factory. So we're just trying to figure out 
who needs to be on that panel and what's called and all that stuff. So watch this space. We are looking to do sort of like a digitizing supply chain uh, talk. Um, one of the things I was going to say for those stores, I wanted to get you, your, your thoughts on this, but for those uh, retailers that actually have uh, bricks and mortar stores, is surely an opportunity to have a return section in there, you know, surely, you know, you know, mm -hmm. if you, rather than being job locked off to, you know, Bob, Tom or wherever it is in yeah. Russia or wherever it is, but. I, I think traditionally retailers have shied against away from doing that because they don't want to damage their brand um, and have sort of substandard stock in the store against their new stock, just like you don't keep markdown stock at the back of your shop for, for three years. But consumers are more um, sustainably minded these days mm. and uh, there's a lot more things happening in the space of um, customers to customers selling or used selling. We know uh, obviously eBay has been doing it for years, but we've got much more competition than there used to be, uh, which shows there's demand in the market. So I've heard some really interesting initiatives being discussed about um, bringing uh, things that you're not wearing anymore that might be damaged or old back into the store to rework them, especially for some sort of higher priced mm -hmm. heritage brands, mm -hmm. for example, some really nice ideas around that, or just generally being able to bring in your old stock uh, for to be recycled and then getting a, a voucher for next time you go in and, and that kind of thing. I think initiatives like that are definitely to be encouraged and are certainly going in the right direction. Aren't you thinking about doing something about like eBay, like encouraging people to resell or something like that? Or yeah, yeah. Well, we already we already do that, so it's just really good. <laughs> and then there's we've worked with a, a number of brands on reworking some of their archive pieces and and that kind of thing. So in a, in a very trend fashion vintage way, which the call which is another great element for to tempt the consumer to do more of that of course okay um, um sort of one sort of um final question for me is um just uh what what can be done with the terms that can't be protest i mean you know what is what is the situation with that can should things be recycled or um steph if i can come to you what in fact what does get happen with stuff that doesn't get reprocessed at the moment through your channels mm -hmm. So depending on the, the product type, so for fashion, if, if we can't reprocess the, the garment, then it's either, um, you know, a recycling or a sustainable route, or um, it's it's traded out as rag, um, basically. Um, traded out as what, sorry? As rag. So okay. it, it's, um, it, it all depends on the product type in terms of... Um, electronics and general merchandise that's slightly different so you can actually break parts down and and refurbish like a tv for example if it's got mm -hmm. a smash screen you want to replace the screen or if you you know the circuit board needs replacing you can start to get three if you've got three um damaged or or faulty returns you can start to cannibalize to make one one good and then break the rest down for spare parts so there's, there's often quite a lot of in-depth um, processes we can follow. Again, it goes back to price point um, and taking the time to do that has a cost to it. And it, it's, just the, it's just the calculation on whether there's a benefit at the end and how that washes out. Okay, cool. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour, so I wouldn't mind just getting your thoughts, uh, each of you, and get maybe a few tips or top tips of for any sort of brands out there or anyone working within retailers, what sort of practices, your two to three practices you, you, you'd you suggest them using. So yeah, I don't know who'd like to start. <clears throat> Patsy, maybe, what's your top tips and how to minimize returns? I think more information about the product is always useful because it's, it's so patchy between different retailers <laughs> in terms of what you get and what you're going on when you order something. Um, and also maybe some messaging around, you know, the impact of, of you, you know, taking advantage of the returns policy or sending something back in a scrumpled heap for reprocessing and just some nice messaging around that could help consumers to be aware that there are implications to how they send things back and it may be then having to go to landfill which you know nobody wants to really generate themselves do they? Helen? Uh, yes yeah, same for me it's all about the information that um at sale I think so the more the better images you can show the more information about sizing the better decision a customer can make before uh, they go out to buy it and Steph your top tips how to minimize returns um so I think having worked in returns for a number of years now it's almost that um as a retailer you need to embrace returns and understand returns 
and um, accept that product will be returned and, and find the best solution to deal with that because it's not it's not going to suddenly disappear it's it's a byproduct of e-commerce um and as everyone and as covid has, has taught us e-commerce and digital journeys are, are you know are the future essentially i'm not saying bricks and mortar is going to disappear but um e-commerce is definitely you know there's still a huge amount of growth in the market um and i think that end-to-end costing and that whole visibility of returns information and converting that back into trading discussions is really important and will impact positively on your bottom line if you can link all of that together. Fantastic. Um, right, I'm just going to bring up the final slide then now, guys, and it's got your pictures on. So here's um, everybody's contact details. So um, is there anyone particularly you'd like to hear from, guys? Um, Helen, Steph, Dr. Uh, Patsy? Um, Steph, I'll come with you. Is there anyone in particular you'd like to hear from from the audience? Just anyone who is interested in any advice on on 3PLs, how we support returns, the how we can support the customer experience, um, and our rectification processes, and yeah, how we add value to our our customers and support them in their e-commerce and and retail selling journeys. And um, Helen. Uh, yeah, for me, any brands, retailers or sellers that have got returns that they'd like to get to the consumer, that'd be interesting to me. Um, Patsy. Any Just queries around <laughs> <laughs> anything you want to know about sustainability impacts of fashion um, or studying fashion business or fashion design, come to me. Okay, fantastic. So there's uh, everybody's contact details. If, um, if anyone wants to get involved with the Fashion Network, that's our email as well. And we'd be more than happy to do introductions to the panelists as well. So normally at these stages, we do go for a class of something rather at the bar, but obviously it's too early and it's <laughs> too digital for that. So maybe when, when, one time we'll be able to get together and have that. Maybe we'll have, a, if, if things change in the new year, maybe we'll do another returns, physical returns talk. So, yeah, so thank you all for your time today, guys, and all your insights. I really appreciate that. And thanks for everybody for listening in. Um, I will speak to you all soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.